get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of RX Bars, which end up selling to Kellogg for $600 million. Check out that interview. Talked about how they built that up. P90X founder Tony Horton talks about how he made money as a street mine, Josh, before he sold hundreds of millions of dollars. He actually, that's how he made his rent and food money as a street mine. He put his hat out on the street. Literally, um, you know, the starving artist, quote unquote, right? Um, and the founder of Atari, Nolan Bushnell, talked about what, you know, Steve Jobs came to him and offered him 33% of Apple for $50,000 and why he said no at the time. So uh, this episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. Our mission is to connect you with your best referral partners and customers. We do that through a complete done for you solution to run an event, a VIP event for larger conferences or software companies. We also um, help people run their own podcast so they can actually have a steady stream of content marketing. Um, the whole thing is, is a greater purpose, Josh, which is um, we realized our grandfathers, which were a huge inspiration to us. My grandfather was a Holocaust survivor who escaped Nazi Germany. And my uh, business partner, his grandfather was a B-17 captain pilot who flew 35 missions over Nazi Germany. And so what we do is we have a scholarship where we have veteran entrepreneurs come to our VIP events. It could be an all, you know, from an all expense paid trip to just the conference itself to just our VIP event. So if you go to rise25.com slash mission, rise25.com slash mission, and you know a veteran entrepreneur, they can apply. It's completely free. So I'm excited for today's guest. I've heard about Josh from uh, Lindsay and Marty Madden for many years. Um, Josh is an amazing entrepreneur. He started his career as a jazz guitarist, and he's been the founder and CEO of five tech companies, which sold for a combined value of over $200 million. Josh built the largest digital promotions agency in the world, serving 74 of the top 100 brands when he founded ePrize, which he later sold. In many accolades, twice named Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year, President Barack Obama Champion of Change Award recipient. Really what what fuels Josh now, it seems, if you haven't checked him out, you need to go to you know joshlinkton.com. They have uh, platypuslabs.com. But he is driving innovation. And so through his books, Discipline, Dreaming, and Proven System to Drive Breakthrough Creativity, his book, New York Times bestseller, The Road to Reinvention, How to Drive Disruption, Accelerate Transformation, and Hacking Innovation book. Um, Josh, I'm excited, and I'm, I'm missing a lot of things like founding partner of Detroit Venture Partners, which with Dan Gilbert and Irvin Magic Johnson, I don't want to leave that out, but, but so many more. So thanks for joining me. Yeah, thank you so much, and thanks for all the great work that you're doing. Let's start, um, I want to, you know, we'll go early on, then fast forward to today, but I know you talk a lot about innovation, and it kind of stems from being a jazz guitarist. And so you, you tied a recent blog post about removing strings, okay? Just, just talk a little bit about that and, and how you go into companies and teach them to remove strings. Sure. Well, so not all of us love listening to jazz, but it's a beautiful American art form. And the neat thing about it to me is that it's real-time innovation. You are literally making it up as you go. And in jazz, less than 1% of the notes are on the written page. The rest you have to, to, to improvise. And to me, it's an exact corollary to what we're doing in business. You know, today, we're not, there's no such thing as an operating manual to success anymore. We have to make decisions in the face of ambiguity. We have to, to move ahead, even though all the notes aren't on the page. We have to make them up as we go. And so uh, what I learned playing jazz was a wonderful teacher to building companies and, and helping even the larger organizations that we serve today. Um, the blog you're referring to has to do, when I was putting myself through college playing music, I studied music in college. We move strings from the guitar. I would have to take off one, two, sometimes three strings from the instrument. And you'd figure that if your resources are cut in half, your creativity is going to tank. But this surprising and counterintuitive thing happened when, when those strings were off, I actually had to solve musical problems in a totally different way. And as a result, my creativity soared. So, so the message I think for, for the folks listening today is that when we find ourselves in a position of adversity or in a resource constrained environment, it actually can be a, a gift. It's calling your creative soul to the surface to try solving problems or seizing opportunities in a really fresh and different way. Yeah. 
in, do you, when you go into companies and with maybe with ePrize, do you put these constraints on on purpose? Like the three strings, you, you know, that forced you to innovate. What were some of the things you did at ePrize that forced innovation? Well, yeah, those forced handicaps actually can really drive creativity. Uh, but we did a lot of fun stuff at, at our company. One thing that was interesting is uh, at one point, it was about 2004 or five player in our field, which is a very fortunate position to be in. Um, but I was worried that we would become complacent and that we would become less innovative because we get cocky. And, and I realized that often greatness is achieved in the face of adversity. You have uh, great athletic challenges and political ones and business challenges. Anyway, since we didn't have a big, strong competitor, I made one up. So I had a big company meeting. I introduced everybody to our fictitious nemesis, the Slither Corporation. So everyone knew it was fake, but Slither wasn't, wasn't to make us feel good. They were bigger than us, faster than us, more profitable, better clients, more innovative. And Slither, Slither became this constant reminder. So we benchmarked ourselves instead of to the real world of competitors, to this ideal competitor that never missed a beat, that never missed a quarter. And we would do fun things. We'd say something like, well, I know we're facing a tough problem. How do you think the folks at Slither are solving it? And what that did is it removed fear. Instead of us like worrying about how our ideas would be uh, perceived, we'd say, oh, the folks at Slither are probably doing X, Y, or Z. You know, you talk a lot about to putting yourself out of business, right? So what were some things um, that you did that would put yourself out of business? Well, I'm a big fan of that. I, I have this belief that, and I've said it all along, that someday a company will come along and put us out of business. It might as well be us. Right. And today, with the rate of change as it is, uh, I think that's such an important premise, you know, that we can't simply rely on yesterday's model and expect the same results when we're living in unprecedented times of change. And so what we did is we tried to, to literally reinvent ourselves every six months or so. I would always say to new hires, you won't recognize this company in, mm. in six months. And that was a core belief of ours. So whether it was revamping our product offerings, whether it's changing our culture, whether it's even changing our customer base. And when I started ePrize in 1999, we were going after these venture-backed.com companies that were going to take over the world. But when dogfood.com was no longer alive, we had to pivot. And then we shifted our whole focus going after large brand advertisers. Thinking about um, 1998 ePrize and some of the evolution of the, the customers you went through. And the, how did the... Um, the product offering change and the customers change throughout the, the cycle of ePress? Yeah, it changed dramatically. So as I mentioned, we, we, we started going after these venture backcom companies that were going to take over the world. But when the 2000 bubble burst, we had to change. And so we then pivoted the whole company going after major brand advertisers like Coca-Cola and Procter & Gamble and, and such. Um, we also changed our product offering. You know, I started the company with one product, which today represents, I think, less than 1% of the company's business. So I think it's, again, it's just, it's such a, an important point for us to, to think that success is this constantly evolving uh, canvas that we need to, to, to evolve with. And that applies to every aspect of our business, from the way we lead, to the way we sell, to the products that we, we, we deliver. Talk about Platypus Labs for a second. You guys have some interesting, some innovation uh, master classes and other ways uh, that people can um, use innovation in their business. What was your thought behind Platypus Labs? A couple of decades of research on, on innovation and human creativity. What I've learned is that, and the research, by the way, is crystal clear that all of us, and I mean all of us, are creative. There's no such thing as that's a creative person, that's not a creative person. And all of us are, are hardwired as human beings to be creative. That's actually our natural state. But we've ten, tended to underdevelop those skills, and many of us have have built, built models around it. We might tell ourselves that we're not creative or maybe you, because you can't draw. Like I can play music pretty well. I can't even draw a stick figure. doesn't mm. mean I'm not a creative person. Right. And so I've made it to a degree my mission in life to help people and organizations cultivate creativity as a, as a powerful resource. And I believe that if people or in companies can even add 5% more capacity in this area, the results can be transform transformational. I mean, it can be the difference between, you know, winning major deals or losing them and, and even the ability to sustain success over time versus evaporating. Um, so I'm just on this crazed mission to help the world become more creative. And we launched a company called Platypus Labs. Platypus Labs is an innovation training and consulting firm. So we help companies of all sizes build and harness creativity and build a culture of inventive thinking and innovation. Mm. What are some, you have some really good stories and it seems that each one of your, your keynotes and speeches you give is kind of tailored to that specific audience, which I love. Not one of them seems to be the same. And uh, you talk a lot about some different stories that you found. Um, I wonder if you talk about some of your, what you found the most interesting ones. I know the ones that stick out to me. You talk about Ben and Jerry's uh, a little bit. You talk about a, um, 
uh, a convict business uh, a little bit. Um, I don't know which one sticks out to you. There'd be an interesting story of kind of reinvention innovation. Yeah, you know, I, I just love collecting stories. And the great thing is that there's amazing innovation happening all over the world. And, you know, it's funny. We, we often think of innovation as these giant product breakthroughs. Uh, I think there's three flavors of innovation. Mm -hmm. So if you think about like a drug that saves lives, then maybe that's innovation in all caps. And, and, but, but that type of innovation is chased by CEOs and people wearing lab coats. We say, yeah, but what about the rest of us? Then think about innovation number two is innovation just with the letter I capitalized. And these could be those four or five innovations a year that are really meaningful. Maybe they don't make history, but they make a difference. And then on a daily basis, think about a lowercase innovation, all lowercase letters. Those are the little micro innovations that each of us can cultivate and deploy you know, dozens of times a week. And yeah, they may not make the cover of a magazine, but they really do add up to big things. And so anyway, one of the stories you asked about a story that I just loved, I just heard recently. So the Coney Island hot dog eating contest hmm. had been going on for 20 some years. And, and, and every year, you know, these big burly folks come on in and try to jam a bunch of hot dogs down right. their throat in 12 minutes. And, and, and the basic premise is that the bigger people would just eat faster the way they normally eat. They just do the, do the same old, but try to do more of it. Mm -hmm. But as we know in business, you can only get, get so far ahead by working harder. And that's right. what these folks were doing. Enter a guy named Takuru Kobayashi. Mm -hmm. So Mr. Kobayashi is this guy, he's like my size, like five, six, and he's thin. And, and he wasn't a big burly guy, but he said, no, this isn't eating for fun. This is eating for sport. So I'm going to train and treat it like sport. Mm -hmm. So he did something completely different than what everybody else did. He trained his body to expand his stomach, but he was lean. He had lots of muscle mass so he could eat quickly. He dissected what does it take to eat a hot dog. So instead of like dipping it in ketchup like you would at a picnic, he separated the bun from the, from the hot dog. He would break the hot dog in half so he could sort of down the meat in one gulp. <laughs> then he would take the bun, dip it in water, squish it together so he could also down that really quickly. So he reimagined something as basic as eating a hot dog. <laughs> anyway, here's what happened. For, for decades, the, the highest score ever in this period, in this, in this contest, was 25.1 hot dogs ever eaten. The first year Kobayashi attempts it, he eats 50. Mm. Well. And so, again, this isn't like, you know, a drug therapy that's going to change <laughs> lives, but, but in, right. in Hino's own craft, he reimagined the norm. He took an innovative approach. He sort of dissected the, the status quo, imagined something different, challenged conventional wisdom, uh, upset the norms, and made history. And so if that guy can do it eating hot dogs, think what we can do in our right. businesses. I love that. Yeah. Um, what else have you seen? You do talk about, you know, it doesn't have to be an uber industry changing thing. What else have you seen that's been reimagined? I don't know. I love the story about the, the gym um, with the convict. What happened? How did you discover that? Well, I'm always on the hunt for great stories. And right. I ended up meeting this gentleman. And the, the quick story for the, for the listeners is that there was a guy named Koss Marte. And Koss was a, uh, was unfortunately born in a really rough environment. He was born into poverty in the Lower East Side of Manhattan. And with a failing school system and bad peer influences, he ended up getting into some trouble. And he tried drugs for the first time at age 11. By age 13, he was selling them. It turns out that Koss was a pretty enterprising guy. So, so by age 19, he had a thriving business. This guy had $2 million in revenue. But then he ran into, well, a regulatory right, issue. Right, exactly. The New York police came on in, shut down Koss's drug business, and sent him to prison for seven years. And at the time, Koss was very overweight. He was in failing health, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. And he ends up getting into some trouble there and gets sent to solitary confinement. So now here he is in a concrete cage, and he's thinking, like, how do I get out of this situation? And just to pass the time, he started exercising using his own body weight, and it made him feel a little bit better. So what he did over the rest of his time incarcerated is he kept exercising, and he learned about fitness and nutrition. That was sort of like his way out. And he helped other inmates get in shape as well. Anyway, when he finally graduated, or, or, or not graduated, got, got released from prison, he says, all right, I, how do I become a legitimate taxpaying citizen? but the options are very limited if you are a convicted felon. So what he ended up doing is doing something really non-traditional. He said, you know, when I was in prison helping people get in shape, I really felt like I mattered. What if I started my own gym? The problem is, how is a guy like Cost Marta, who can't even get a, get a lease, going to compete with LA Fitness and right. Equinix and SoulCycle and all this? So what he ended up doing is be a, he took a very creative approach. First of all, he finally got a landlord to give him some space, but then instead of creating a look-alike gym, like the big mega gyms, he decided to open up the world's first gym of its kind. So Koss opened up Con Body, a prison-themed gym. Their slogan, do the time. And the whole experience is not only a killer workout, but it's modeled literally after being in prison. Like you go through the prison gates and you're training in the yard with the others. The, other, the members of the gym are called inmates. They get to do selfies in front of like a, a perp walk. 
the whole thing is really fun and, and, and at the same time a great workout. So because it was unique and compelling and different, the gym totally took off. And I spoke to Klaus recently. He told me that he's gotten out more than 10,000 paying customers in New York. Wow. He's streaming his courses online for a fee, and he's, he's crushing it. And so here's a guy who came from the lowest environment you can imagine. He used innovation, creativity, inventive thinking to beat the odds and ultimately win. And yeah. again, if, if he can do that, I mean, wow, think what we can do. Totally. And you look for, and I know with your, you've seen a lot of businesses with Detroit Venture Partners. I think you've mentioned you've invested in over a hundred of startups. And, um, you know, you look at the jockey, um, not just like the idea, and you'd rather have an A plus jockey with a C idea and how someone actually takes it and innovates and disrupts. Um, there's one in particular, I think that, um, you said it is probably one of the more successful ones. Um, I wonder if you could kind of talk through just the evolution um, of this uh, this one. And I think it, I don't know, I think it even predates Blurt and Favors. But what did you see in that particular person that you know made you want to invest and then how they uh, innovated? Yeah, what we've learned from an investor standpoint is that the, the people who are the most successful are not exactly what you might think. You might think is the most, you know, loud mouth, you know, great speaker is the, is the best entrepreneur, but sometimes it's the quiet people, the ones that are more thoughtful. So the qualities that we look for were coachable, open-minded, humility, and a track record of, of working through adversity to a positive outcome. And it's funny, I, uh, in the case you're talking about, I made two investments almost identical in time. And one was an A person and a C idea, the other one was a C I, uh, uh, an A idea with C people. So, uh, and, and I invested the same amount, $600,000 in each. And before long, here's exactly what happened. The person with the A idea, who was a C per team, ended up screwing it up. I lost everything, zero, yeah. took, took a total loss. Yeah. The other one, the A person turned the C idea into an A idea. It became Marchant Labs, which is one of the top performing companies in our portfolio. So it really does get back to people when you're looking at entrepreneurial pursuits. Mm -hmm. Um, I know you have to run, Josh. So where can we point people towards to learn more um, so they can you know, learn more online? Yeah, thank you so much. Well, I would love to engage and help people, big or small businesses, even individuals, in any way that I can, helping them build and harness creativity. So if you'd like to learn about a little bit more about me personally and my books, just visit joshlinkner.com, L-I-N-K-N-E-R, so joshlinkner.com. And if you're interested in having our uh, company help you and your organization, please visit platypuslabs.com. And again, we have training and workshops and all kinds of consulting that we can help organizations build and harness creativity, innovation, and inventive thinking. Thank you, Josh. Yeah, I suggest anyone check out his website. They have made some great blog posts and some really, um, you can you know check out some of Josh's great stories of innovation and what he's lived. So thank you, Josh. Ch check out joshlinkter.com. I uh, really appreciate it. Thanks again. Have All a great day. Right. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.